All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast, the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian, a narco-capitalist perspective. That's what we do here on episode 192 of the show, and we're going to be talking about the Adam Sandler flick, Uncut Gems. It's the second Adam Sandler movie that we've done on this show, the first one being Billy Madison. Will this one stack up? We will see. Uh, we'll go down to Robert and check. What What is uh, your take on whether this movie will be as entertaining or as fun of a discussion especially with our guest who will introduce in the last night's portion of the show, as Billy Madison was when we did that one a few years ago. Billy Madison was just some nostalgia fest talking about, wasn't it funny when he said this, and wasn't it funny when he said that, and I grew up watching this. It was a terrible film, but it was funny for a 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old audience, and that's that's what that was this this is actually an adult film with adult actors doing adult acting things with actually like a script and a director and they weren't just making it up on the spot and there's no like two minute musical music video in the middle of it for no reason so yeah i think this is actually a, a film that you might want to go and watch and then talk about and discuss and in hopefully interesting intellectual way well quasi intellectual considering the uh the the participants yeah present company Damn. included but our guest is actually going to bring uh i think a lot more to it similar to how hamilton if it was just us knuckleheads it wouldn't have been a very good show but because we had tho on he brought a lot of knowledge about hamilton's history to the discussion of hamilton the musical and we've, of course, reaffirmed our thoughts that we are not musical uh, inclined <laughs> dudes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we should get into the last nighters portion of the show and introduce our guest right after these massages. Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Paul Johnson, and we are The Last Nighters. You can find us on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Tonight is actually episode 135 of the show. I know last week I kept saying that that show was 135, but that was actually 134. We talked about Hamilton with Phil Bishop at the Mises Institute. Tonight we're going to be talking about Uncut Gems, the Adam Sandler movie, as episode 135 of The Last Nighters. And we're going to have a great guest uh, who will introduce in just a moment. But uh, you can support us over on Patreon. Go to lastnighters.com slash Patreon. We've got a couple of really cool things coming up that we're going to be offering uh, to our Patreon people. One of the things is being able to watch live streams like this as we're making the sausage. But uh, there's a new feature that's coming out on a service called Movies Anywhere that allows us to watch a movie with up to eight different people uh, at the same time. So it's, it's something I'm going to try out. So I think if, if you're one of our Patreons, we'll schedule a time to do that and we can all watch a movie together. And maybe Robert and I can do some kind of uh, MSTK3 thing. I don't know. I don't, I, that might be uh, above our um, skill set. So we'll see. But uh, check it out. LastNightHour.com slash Patreon for that and more. And tonight we're here to talk about the Adam Sandler movie. It's a serious Adam Sandler movie. Uh, we did Billy Madison a couple of years ago, and tonight is uh, similar in vain to the Punch Drunk Love version of Adam Sandler, where he's actually taking a serious tone. And uh, it starts with a hole in his butt and ends with a hole in his head. It's Uncut Gems, and we're going to be talking with our pal Pat McFarlane of Liberty Weekly 
He's going to join us to talk about this movie, about gambling addiction, the NBA playoffs, and precious, precious gemstones on tonight's episode. So you can find his work over at libertyweekly.net. He's been on the show with us many, many times in the past. He's a good friend of ours. His most recent appearance was for American Psycho, which was back at, uh, I think, the end of May, perhaps early June, something like that. Things are fuzzy during lockdown times. Um, I, I, I've lost all concept of time, but uh, welcome back to the show, Pat. Uh, we, we really enjoy having you here. Hey, thanks, guys. I really love being here with you guys. And now that my show is still on hiatus, which I've been wanting to come back, I've really been wanting to come back. So believe me there, um, it's really good to jump into this sphere um, and then be able to jump out maybe without commitments. Because I feel like once I get the ball rolling, I need to keep it rolling. Um, but I am a attorney. I've been practicing for about two years. I practice in personal injury and civil rights law on the plaintiff side, so the good guys, right? Um, but you can find my work at libertyweekly.net. I had a podcast I really, really enjoy working on, and I've kept it alive in the hosting realm uh, throughout this whole time and with support from my very generous patrons, whom I love very much and who are somewhat neglected, but I will get back to you. I love you. Uh, but just glad to join you for the show, and I'm really excited to hear your take on Uncut Gems. I really like this movie, so let's get rolling. All right, well, very good, and we will get rolling uh, with the Google description, which is how we usually fire this thing off. So, without further ado, this is, of course, Uncut Gems. came out last year, 2019. It's a crime-slash-dark comedy film, 2 hours and 15 minutes, according to Google. Rated R. 7.4 IMDb, 92% Rotten Tomatoes, 90% Metacritic, and only 70% of Google users liked it. It's uh, currently available on Netflix. That's where Robert and I both watched it. And the description reads, A charismatic jeweler makes a high-stakes bet that could lead to the windfall of a lifetime. In a precarious high-wire act, he must balance business, family, and adversaries on all sides in pursuit of the ultimate win. Came out on Christmas of last year. Kind of a weird Christmas movie. Uh, the, direct, <laughs> the directors are Josh and Benny Safdie. Not sure if I'm saying the name right. Uh, came in with a box office of $50 million. Won or, or was nominated for Independent Spirit Award for Best Feature. And won an Independent Spirit Award for Best Male Lead. Adam Sandler, of all people. Uh, it uh, also features Kevin Garnett, Julia Fox, Dinah Menzel, and a few other folks. Uh, one critic's review says it's entertaining, but not in any traditional or even non-traditional sense of the word. So, uh, Robert, I will go to you for your opening uh, take on this film. Well, it is refreshing to see Adam Sandler back in a serious role. I, I understand that he didn't want to take the role because he was worried about the 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 view that it's like this kind of greedy Jew character. And it's like, should I play this? Is it playing into the stereotype or is it not? And ultimately he went and did it. And I wouldn't necessarily say he's greedy. I would say that he is, has incredibly high time preference. And he is just this degenerate gambler. guy. Like he, he the idea and the concept of saving some money up, so that he can place a bet on something is like totally foreign to him. If he has in his greedy little hands, uh, I said the word greedy, oh well. If he's got in his hands any kind of object that's of any value, even if it's not his, he's going to hawk it and then place some crazy bet. And maybe he's a good gambler, maybe he's not, but it's just bizarre that he is even alive at the beginning of this movie. It just, I, I would think that somebody would have been fed up with him and killed him long ago if this is his normal behavior. Um, the description says he's charismatic, and I don't know about that. I found him very unpleasant. I found his relationship with his girlfriend to be very unrealistic other than maybe that he's got some money but i i don't see his like attractive qualities um and i i have a relationship with his wife to be very very realistic on the other hand where she just just hates the guy and he's sick of his crap um but 
uh, overall, it's a, it's a very entertaining film. It's very non-traditional. Um, it doesn't have like a traditional kind of hero's journey or anything like that. It's, it's basically the story of his high wheeling, dealing, gambling ways finally catching up with him. Okay, and that's why I prefer Adam Sandler does pornos. Pat? Well, Adam Sandler's pornos are definitely... No, I found this trope to be true in terms of Adam Sandler, and my my mom, of all people, absolutely despises Adam Sandler. And my wife and I actually had a discussion about this after we first saw this movie, is that Adam Sandler... And I think this must be a trope of his films is that Adam Sandler is admittedly a very kind of unattractive, somewhat charismatic, controversially charismatic person. But in all of his films, he always ends up getting the girl. And often these girls are very attractive and definitely not in his league. And it's a quality that I know at least the women in my life don't appreciate because... You know, maybe he's a great guy. I don't know. But he he doesn't seem like it often sometimes in his movies. But he always ends up with the girl. And I guess they get annoyed with that for some reason. So it's interesting. Yeah. I can see that. Though I, th- I would say that his um, his older movies back when, when I was growing up, and it was more raunch comedies that he was just making movies with his friends because he could. And it's like, you know, he was famous enough to be able to do it and pull it off. And... He made two classics, Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore. Uh, but back in yeah, those... And The Wedding Singer? I think that's a lesser movie. between. Really? Those two. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, we can get into that maybe those... if you want to turn this into Adam Sandler. Yeah, Billy Madison and, and uh, Happy Gilmore are equal high marks that I think were back-to-back. And then it was a, a downward slope from there. A couple of, you know, ups and downs. But I don't think anything he's done since has reach the greatness that either of those films are well i but, guess you fuckers live through it i yeah. was a wee child to call I'll those movies here. films is a bit of a stretch <laughs> they, they made 90 minutes all right so that, that's oh. all it takes but my point is in those movies he wasn't like he was a goofy acting guy but he wasn't like a goofy looking guy whereas his more recent stuff he's more um banked on the his awkwardness and his like goofy i mean they even explicitly call this out when he tries to make amends with his wife in this and she's looking at him and she's like I, I just i just can't look at you and take you seriously you're just so fucking ridiculous looking you know and uh, so I, I i think you're right in the the point that he ends up with a girl in the present day movies because he looks goofy as fuck but in the older movies it was like he acted goofy as fuck so like he was so childish in Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore, but he still ended up with the girl in either, you know, in both of those movies. Uh, but I think for different reasons. Yeah, it was kind of endearing then, maybe a little bit, where some women could see that as being endearing and, and cute. Um, yeah. What about Eddie Murphy? I mean, you know, in Eddie Murphy's later catalog, he's kind of taken the same arc, don't you think? Well, since I haven't seen an Eddie, Eddie Murphy, Murphy has a later catalog. Well, yeah, Metro. Uh, Norbit. Have you seen Norbit? This is actually a family film. No, family. No, really. he got I will not see that because it was super racist and problematic. We should do that. We should. We should make really. A, we should watch Norbit. Norbit. Yeah. Have you heard of this show? I have heard of Norbit, and I recall you making um, a comment about mention of it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'll let you guys take over. Now, isn't one of the things in Norbit he does the same thing that he does in uh, what is it, Doctor Doolittle, where he plays multiple characters? Yeah, and um, the Nutty Professor. And yeah. So he yeah he plays like three or four characters in it. It's it's pretty funny. Okay, I'm not sure how we got to Eddie Murphy from uh, Adam Sandler, but. That's okay. They, they have similar career arcs. That's it. So uncut okay. gems. Uncut gems. So there's there's a, a couple of things that I just had in my notes related to this. And that's because Sandler works in the Diamond District of New York. 
and he seems to be doing fairly well. He has like a high end clientele. He's got a, a business associate that he works with who like is kind of like what's the right word? But he's bringing in these big fish, and he gives him a cut, like a commission for bringing in these. And he's these a finder. Gonna, yeah, like a finder's fee. He he's got ins in different groups and whatnot, and he brings in like NBA stars and whatnot. And it seems like a, a very like up and up you know relationship. And I was wondering if you guys thought that, um, you know, the old leftist trope that advertising like manipulates people to buy things they don't actually need and thus you're being exploited or taken advantage of. Do you think that they would view this scenario similarly where this guy is bringing in people like Kevin Garnett or other basketball players who are really good at basketball and they have a lot of money? But he's sort of taking advantage of their desire to be blingy or whatever, you know, whatever the the thing is to be showy. Do you do you think that that I'm not asking if you think that this is a bad thing. I think it's totally like hey, if he if he wants it and he's got it, the other guy's got it and they're willing to make an exchange, it's totally fine. But do you think that someone from that other persuasion would view this as an exploitation of a Kevin Garnett by the Adam Sandler character? Well, I think Robert. That, I, I think that hopefully I'm not garbling up, but I, I, I got to be impressed with the diamond industry as a whole, that they have created this industry out of, you know, shiny rocks that they have made it so that, you know, the successful marketing campaigns have convinced people that you got to, you know, have a diamond for a wedding engagement band and two that they salary. are right. Two months salary. You, it's it's ridiculous, but you've convinced people enough people that these things are desirable and that you got to do it because this is the only way to express your love. That this is you have to do this way because in the bigger the better, right? I wouldn't say it's exploitative, of course, but it's it's it is impressive to invent an industry and invent a market demand for a product that has no other necessarily like industrial uses i mean i guess you could use them for glass cutters and i mean i'm sure their diamonds have uses but to essentially invent this entire industry on a non functional i mean other than like you say bling you know and so that people can show off Ooh, look at what i got look at this rock that I, my husband gave me that kind of thing um I would say it's just impressive. I, I, I don't really know other way to say it. I, I wouldn't say that it's exploitative. Yeah, but, but do you think that somebody who looks at a scenario where advertising bad, <clears throat> getting you to buy something that you wouldn't otherwise buy, something unnecessary, right? It's the well, people do that paradox. all the time, though. I mean, people buy, like, the Sham Wow, and they buy, like, OxyClean, and, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's the entire late-night advertising industry, is buying shit you don't need. Right, right, but it's kind of the Galbraithian thing, <clears throat> where you're being convinced or manipulated into doing so, and and in this microcosm of the movie, it's these rich athletes who have money to burn and are are seeking to have status symbols, and so then you've got a guy like Adam Sandler's character out here providing that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that? somebody who's of the woke persuasion would view that as an exploitative relationship. I think that they would probably. Yeah. They're, that they would be seeing that you're convincing them somehow through your mysterious evil ways that you are going to manipulate this person into thinking that he needs this thing. And that clearly he's this superstitious person or something. And that this rock has magical powers and it's going to help him with his, basketball game or it's going to impress his friends with the magic bling or whatever i could see them concocting some sort of a story in that in that vein but it's it's, it's hard for them to paint the multi multi-millionaire as the victim in this case but i don't know maybe right and if any, if anything he ends up underpaying for it right yeah what, what do you got pat 
Well, I don't think it'd be hard to paint the multimillionaire as a victim because you just go back to what do the NBA owners make compared to what the players make in terms of their salary for playing the actual game. I mean, the owners make a crap load of money. This is something that's, I mean, I pay some attention to sports, but at the end of the day, the players really, a lot of people think they're overpaid, but at the end of the day, the players make a lot less money than the owners do and everything, the merchandisers that surround it all. And I just watched that. This is funny how this plays into it, but I just watched that Michael Jordan, the the last dance on Netflix as well. Maybe we should do a series on that. Probably not applicable, but um, he made all of his money from advertising, not from playing basketball. He was actually, I think he was actually underpaid and Scottie Pippen was really underpaid, woefully underpaid. So that's the angle they would take, you know, KG, I guess KG doesn't get a whole lot of money from this, but. But, but they're in the open market though. They could sell their skills to anybody they wish. I mean, I'm sure he's at that very peak of his game. There must be a, he, he's the player with the highest demand on the planet. So if the NBA is underpaying him, wouldn't you think that there would be some other organization that looks like, oh, there's some value I can get there and I can offer him some more money and still make plenty of money? But who has more money than the NBA? China. China. <laughs> well, the thing about the NBA is that they have a, um, a cap. A salary cap for a team and if you go over the cap then you pay penalties and if you're over the cap in multiple years then you pay double penalties and so a lot of star players will take less money so that there's additional funds under the cap to be able to get complementary pieces to teammates that fill Absolutely. out the roster yeah yeah so they'll take like, a pay cut to to win a championship yeah they do it all the time because right. they value the championship because the money like right the more you have of it, the less each dollar means to you. So if you're already a multi multi-millionaire and you've, you'd rather win the championship than make an extra few bucks. Right. And then you, then you want to play in a, like a Texas or a Florida team. Cause there's no uh, state income tax. State income. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Miami, baby. Well, so, make to push back, so something that Robert said was like, well, buying things that you don't need. Right. Well, that's such a subjective, judgment you know and how do you know that kevin garnett doesn't need how important is it for his career he needs status symbols i mean you're in a business that's all about status um if you have higher status maybe then you get more endorsements from shoe designers or something like that you know this this whole determination and this is exactly what val what determines value in the first place is this subjective um, determination of what something is worth, whatever someone is willing to pay for it. So maybe that would be the counter to what maybe leftists would criticize about this film or this situation um, or creating this entire market. But to defend this market in of itself, I wanted to push back on something Robert said. Basically, like this market wasn't created. I mean, as, as far back as you go in the history of when mankind emerged from apes one of the first things that we noticed was that they started adorning themselves with jewelry so to say that this market is entirely created i don't think is even accurate well in my defense i meant for specifically for diamonds right like and, i was talking about the industrial referring... uses i see yeah, go ahead but there's also um the de beers government sanctioned cartel that I'd have to do some research into this and maybe post something in the show notes page at lastnerds.com slash 135 about De Beers and the um, the ability because the government did not permit additional competitors into the marketplace that they were able to reduce the supply and thus drive up the price uh, due to the scarcity of the diamonds that they were mining. And uh, there's also the water diamond paradox, which is also very famous because water is very valuable. It's necessary for life, yet it's had for a pittance normally, whereas diamonds have very little utility, like you were saying, Robert, uh, yet they go for a very high value. And uh, what that doesn't take into account is like the time and place of where it is. So, like if you're in a desert and there's no water to be found, you're willing to pay a very high price for that water. 
Whereas if you're in the lap of luxury, water is totally abundant and you're a rich NBA player, then certain things are more important to you, like status. And so a diamond will be far more valuable to you uh, subjectively. And uh, the other thing related to this movie is this is in 2012 where, where it's set. And it was shot, you know, like a couple of years ago. But Garnett was on the downside of his career. He was, I think, 36 years old, as depicted in the movie. And they, they actually relate it to um, a real life, like, series of um, events. So, like, of they game, were playing. Yeah. Yeah, the playoffs against uh, Philadelphia 76ers is like the second round. Um, and they ended up winning that, of course, in Game 7 where he wins his big bet. But uh, they go on to lose to LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh in the uh, Eastern Conference Finals. But this is like four or five years after the big three came together, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and Kevin Garnett, uh, to win the championship in 2008. And so this is like the last kind of chance for them to try to win a, another one. And so that's why a lot of uh, Sandler's bets were paying off because people were writing Kevin Garnett off because he was older, slower, not as mobile. He had injuries. But because he had that relationship with Garnett, he had like one-on-one -on -one interactions with him. And he was like, Hey, I know he's like super hyped about this like rare stone. I think he's gonna go off tonight because he thinks it imbues power into him. And so that's why he was willing to make those bets. But also, the guy's a gambling addict. Like he was betting money he owed to three different people. Like that money was spoken for three times over. It's like he's running the fucking Fed, you know? Like <laughs> it was incredible the the how he would take a bird in the hand and shit in the bush, you know, ridiculously. And like you were saying, Robert, earlier, he should have been probably killed multiple times over with how he was treating people who he owed large sums of money to. Like, this isn't yeah. a couple of hundred bucks. He owed a hundred grand to Arno. He owed who knows how much to those guys he gave a fake watch to. He owed money to um, his father-in-law. He owed money to a bunch of people, and and he owed them all simultaneously. And whatever money he had, they all had equal claim to it. And yet he let it ride on some trifecta like bet. Like he had to get the opening tip, he had to get the t the the points, the rebounds. They had to get the win. Like twenty five different things had to happen for him to win. That is insane. Yeah, and if he if he loses it. He's probably a dead man. I mean, spoilers. He, he's a dead man anyway. But that was probably due to him imprisoning a couple of gangsters in his business while he watched the game. This is like the further the, the the last insult that these hardcore killers with shark eyes. That guy had shark eyes. He was not messing around. He's not someone to mess around with. And he's like, look at this cool bed I did, guys. Now, aren't you excited now you're gonna get paid and he's just like i do not give all my fucks went out the door when you locked me in for three hours dude yeah you know when i was watching this i was like he's running a luxury gem business to high clientele he's got a really nice house and an apartment in the city it seems like he's got other sources or you know other like What's the right word? Like, um, he's got a certain amount of wealth. Uh, so I was like, why doesn't he just sell his house and pay off his bets? Or why doesn't he just do this and pay off his bets? Why, why is selling this thing for like $200,000? He, he was hoping to get a million. But why is that going to make or break him? Like, to me, he was living such an extravagant lifestyle that the amount of money he was staking to or trying to win didn't seem worth it well and it wouldn't be enough for a guy like that no matter what he wins it's not going to be enough he wins that 1.3 million or whatever it was and then he goes on his vacation he comes back two weeks later that, mo that money's gone well he I owes mean, half of it to he owes half of it to half the town but yeah. then whatever money he does have is going right back into his gambling habit so and I know women are risk takers and they like risk takers, 
but I did not buy that relationship where she's like, oh man, I love you. Look at your, your, your betting, even though you got 50 guys trying to kill you right now. Oh, uh, this is so exciting. And I'm going to go and try and hide from these gangsters as I'm placing this bet. I, maybe there's a personality of a female out there that's into that kind of thing. But I, from my pers from my experience as a human being that's been on this planet for as many years as I have been, women are far more pragmatic. And yes, they're attracted to risk and the big rewards that come with that, but only so long as you're winning. If you if you lose, then and they don't see you as a stable provider, then they're out. And I think that that, that relationship was doomed to fail. I think it, it was gonna last for as long as he was winning. And then it was as soon as he was out. So all that whole, I love you crap, was I, I just didn't buy it uh maybe maybe she really did maybe there's something in the relationship that happened uh am i crapping out sorry guys i'm gonna maybe i'm gonna have to speak in short sound bites like i'm on cable news or something sorry am i, I am thought I, it was believe believable i i thought it was believable that that she would hang around him uh, his his girlfriend on the side, and I don't know if it's that. So okay, as an aside, my wife and I—it's not an aside—but my wife and I have been watching junk television on Hulu, and one of the shows is um, Unexpected, and it's basically MTV's Teen Mom. And I I know I feel bad enough about watching this shit, um, but it's it's very junk television, mindless crap, but. The 16 year old kids, you know, that grow up in, in bad environments and generations and generations of teen moms and serial impregnators, that's, I could see them doing this shit, you know, just getting caught up way over their head. And this girlfriend, what was her position? Was she an escort? Do, it wasn't clear. Julia? To no, she, she yeah. worked there. She, she, but she also yeah, she sold for him. Like, photography right she's she was selling her photography skills to high was she also like an escort or something like that or like a, a a middleman like a lead generator like the other guy i didn't um, get that impression i got the impression that she was a photographer that she was trying to get high profile clients and make big money there and that she was using her feminine wiles to kind of secure those contracts yeah, wasn't she like um, she's working the uh, the counter like she was the counter girl at the gem store? Yeah, that was her day job. And then her night job was her photography career. Yeah, and Coke habit. <laughs> well, you got to have a good time. Yeah. So in the pre-show content, we were uh, you guys were talking. Well, I got more wine about uh, the weekend who makes an appearance in this film. And whether the weekend and Julia were doing anything that Sandler's character should have been upset about or not. So let's drag that from the bonus content into the main content here. My opinion, because I didn't hear what you guys said because I was out getting wine, was that the weekend was trying to put the moves on her when they were in the bathroom together doing the coke, and she was resisting ish, it seemed. Like maybe she was gonna like yeah doing in. that play resisting go ahead yeah mm -hmm. but 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 you know as an as what's his name Ari Adam Sandler's character he doesn't know that all he knows is his girlfriend is in this bathroom locked in there with this famous guy doing drugs and being in there alone and whatever I think that he was probably you know justifiably upset about this. She also touched his dick. Yeah, she yeah. did. Might have been so, over the pants, but still. Still, still a dick touch. Dick still. Touch. I mean, <clears throat> was she doing it really to... I don't know. I, I think it was justified in being upset. Maybe if he knew beforehand that she was doing it to secure a lead or something like that. Um, maybe he shouldn't have been so upset if he had known about it and agreed to it. But, yeah. What do you think, Robert? Uh, I mean, I I think that oftentimes you get involved with people like that 
and you're kind of playing with fire so that when you act all surprised, you kind of had it coming. Like, you know, in terms of her relationship with Ari or her relationship with the weekend. I think with what you're saying is Ari, right? Like, I think, I think Ari knew what kind of a person she was and that there was a certain amount of what attracted him to her is what's attracted lots of men to her and that she's going to be that person and she's going to be flirtatious and she's going to get in compromising situations probably and to expect her to not do that is kind of a double standard like oh i met you in a club and man you we got physical like right away and you're clear we did coke together and then like three weeks later i catch you doing coke with some guy oh my god i'm so outraged i mean i'm kind of you know reading into the situation a little bit i don't know exactly how they met i don't know how she got hired on at the place but she struck me as this was a normal activity for her and for him to get outraged by finding, I mean, clearly, I mean, he found the two alone in a bathroom and they were just getting kind of semi-sexual, which might've led to full on sexual, but this is kind of her jam. This is kind of what she does. And for him to get a little bit outraged about it is uh, a little bit disingenuous, I think. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that, Robert. It seemed to me similar to some relationship I've had in the past where it's either really good or really bad, like a roller coaster. And I think that uh, she was like that. So like they were either like madly in love with each other and like so into each other and everything was great or it was a total disaster and it kept fluctuating between those two things. And then of course he had this whole situation with um, his family with his estranged wife where due to religious reasons, they were still maintaining the semblance of being together for extended family and for the kids. And they were like trying to plan when they were gonna you know, make the announcement that they were divorcing or separating. So there were a lot of things kind of at play here uh, that, um, and you know, it also plays in, I think, to Ari, like being, has that gambling spirit in all aspects. Like he's taking risks everywhere all the time, even in relationships. So not only in the gambling and in the business and in the shafting of people he owes money and betting the money he owes to people he doesn't even have a claim on, which I have a great Rothbard clip where he's talking about money and banking and how if uh, the banker has like this great tip on a race and he takes the money out, uh, you've entrusted the money, you've put the money into the bank and it's supposed to be safe and whatever. And he takes that money out. He's got a great tip on a race and he goes out and he, and he wins a bunch of money. Well, he's still stolen the money, even though he didn't lose it because he, he took it from your position and put it at undue risk. So I'll post that on the show notes page because it's really good. I'm not sure how I got to this point, but I, I had a note to mention that at some point. So that's why I did that. This is such Excellent. a great show. Excellent. It makes sense. Raising it in. I love like it. it. Well, he, he says crookery is objective. Basically, if you take it and bet it, you've stolen the money. What happens after that is immaterial to the act of the theft. Oh, yeah. Adam Sandler is acting disingenuously in thievery the whole movie. This is his character, and this is why I was said he should have been dead long before the movie started. If this is how he acts all the time, and there's nothing to, there's nothing to, for us to go on to assume that he doesn't. He is this whole movie is hectic. He is high drama the whole time, and he's robbing Peter to pay Paul. He's floating money he doesn't have. He's he's pissing off all kinds of dangerous people, and he's acting like it's. Like it's almost like it's no big deal. Like he's got killers in his in the room with him, and he's acting like, "Oh, come on, I this is whatever. I'm gonna get your money or whatever." Just, I, I I think he was he was playing with forces he didn't understand, and he should have known better. He should have known better. I mean, this he's he's playing with killers, and if, sooner or later he's gonna get burned. You play stupid yeah. games, you win stupid prizes. That's what I've heard said many times, and I think it's true. Sounds like what's going on right now with the rioting and people getting killed around the rioting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Pat, you you wanted to talk about this movie, and in your description of it to me, 
via IMs. You were just like, things happen and just keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. Uh, it's just like cascading on top of each other. Um, so w what was the thing that made you want to discuss this one that was related to that? I mean, I think this movie is a fucking masterpiece. And maybe I'm one to really kind of jump on that train. But the the way this movie makes you feel is incredibly anxious and just complete anxiety because the way it's shot um people are talking over each other there's no expositional dialogue which is something i wanted to talk about based on what robert just said um but the camera angles are very claustrophobic um i was watching something on youtube a review about this movie and it was talking about how usually you have your actors you have like X's on the ground for, for cinematography purposes. So you know exactly how to get the angle right. But this was shot with like, I don't know if it was a telescopic lens, but they gave the actors a lot of room to interact with each other. And the dialogue is written in a way that it's, I love the dialogue writing. It's very realistic and people are talking over each other. One thing just happens after another and you, I know this because I've watched this film with my wife and my son and my son is 14 months old and he's running around screaming and getting into stuff and just being a 14 year old or a 14 month old boy. And this movie's playing at the same time. And my wife and I are just getting more and more worked up and like, holy shit, I can't handle this right now. Like we got to turn this shit off. We just got to turn this shit off. And, I'm uh, so glad. I'm so yeah. glad you brought that up, Pat, because I yeah, had the yeah. same the same experience. Like like you said, what uh, the, the no exposition. I noticed that also. There's zero explaining dialogue going on in this movie. You are just in this world, and it's happening, and you got to figure out what it is, what they're talking about through context, which I, I loved. It was just like we're, you're being set in this world, and yeah, nobody's yeah, taking I, the time to explain it. I hate expositional dialogue too, and like. So I, I was a creative writing major in undergrad. And so I, I hate movies that do that. And I, I like that it leaves it up, up to us to figure out what the relationships are between these characters. And, and this is a great example of it. You were just trying to explain his relationship with this girlfriend and his wife and uh, this guy who brings leads in. And we have no fucking idea what... And but I think this our interpretations of it is really what gives meaning to the piece, and the fact that there's a little ambiguity into it, it just makes it a deeper work of art. I think. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that for sure. And now, and in terms of the tension, I stopped this movie I think three or four times, simply because I was like, "Holy crap, I got to stop this!" and reset and rest because i am so amped up there's the tension especially when he's got that bet on the line and he's got the mobsters in the in the booth and he's watching the game i stopped that scene like two or three times this movie <laughs> is great with tension it's almost yeah. too much for me as like some old man or something i don't know but it was it was very masterfully done yeah, you're usually the one who's saying there's not enough tension in a scene or that you really appreciate there being a sufficient amount of tension. There needs to be this. some. Yeah. But this movie cranks it up. It's great. And, but it, it was everything, though. I mean, it was so that, like, the camera angles, the lens they used, it was the grain of the footage and the frame rate of the footage. And it was the dis, you know... Um, the dialogue and the way that all of the actors were placed in the set too and the delivery and holy shit kevin garnett did an awesome job i mean i thought his his performance was incredible and i i thought we'd touch on this too but adam sandler this is the performance of his career i think i mean i really do i i've enjoyed a lot of his work before and to be fair, I guess I, I haven't seen Spanglish or Love Actually. Um, but I don't know how it could possibly top this. I mean, he he created a character that was um, at the same time that you disliked him and that he was kind of grimy. I rooted for him. And Robert, I know you pushed back on this because earlier in the episode you were saying you didn't like him. But I was rooting for him. 
And even though I thought he was a bad person, I thought there were elements of him that were an uncut gem. He's a gem. Oh. Oh, cool. oh, boo, boo this man. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, and um, that's what he is. He's an uncut gem and he has qualities in him that are very good. I think he's a good father or he wants to be, but he's not a good father. He's um, got a good wanting heart. to be a good father and yeah. being a good father are two that's wildly different. different things. That's true. But he he tries, even though it's an afterthought. You know. Yeah, I, I I think you have something to this. He has a good heart, but he doesn't have execution. He doesn't. I think have... he's a gam- He's a degenerate gambler that is an asshole to everybody he deals with. He is mm-hmm. going to burn so many bridges if he survives the movie and goes on and they make a sequel or whatever. Who's he going to get money from? Who's he going to? Nobody. Nobody would want to deal do business with this guy. I wouldn't. Yeah. Who would want to be in a relationship with him? Nobody, I I would hope. We must be seeing rock bottom. I mean, we have to be seeing that. Well, he's put himself in this position where he's willing to die if the bet doesn't pay off. Like, this is the culmination of a long-term, like, growth of his, like, being a speculator, making long-shot bets, hoping that they'll pay off. Well, he's living in fantasy land, though. Oh yeah, yeah, and and he's he's actually taken a very long view of this getting this opal from these West Af- very East unlike African very unlike Jews yeah. uh, in Ethiopia from a mine who stole it with this you know this cover of this guy having this compound fracture, which not a good way to open a film. You go right out of Amazon's butt, and then you see this compound fracture at the Ethiopian mine. It's like that's a uh, yeah, just the hits keep coming. But um, there's also the appraisal. Like, he had banked on this Opal being worth over a million dollars and going to this auction. He spent two years trying to get this. And then to get it appraised for, what was it, 100, 125,000? When he finally got yeah, it like that, yeah. into the, the auctioneer's hands because he foolishly let Garnett take it with him to the playoff game. In exchange yeah, for that was, his Celtic ring. Yeah, that uh, I had a little bit of a problem with that scene where it was like an obvious mistake he was making and it seemed like to be artificially creating tension. Like obvious plot point is obvious kind of situation where it's like, here, I'm going to do this dumb thing and it's not going to work out. Now you're going to bring it back, right? You're going to bring it back, you promise? Like super promise? Even though I'll take your 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 Celtic, you know, championship ring as collateral, but it still felt like, why would he do that? I mean, it made sense a little bit. He's like, okay, you got to put it on Instagram. You're gonna get some bling shots. You're gonna mention my name, that kind of thing. We're gonna increase my brand. So, in that sense, if this is something that happens a lot, but he had, he had so much writing on this stupid opal, right? I mean, of course, he's going to screw it up, and it, even if he hits, he's going to the money's going to be gone. But it seemed like a even for a crazed gambler to be a, a risky move. Yeah, but it was Kevin Garnett. You know, like is Kevin Garnett going to fuck you over? Probably not. But he's going to be a little bit flaky, right? And you need that stone back by a certain date to be in this auction, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it was flaky because, uh, what was the guy's name, Deontay, who was the handler dude? Uh, he kept saying, oh, yeah, I'll meet you here at this time. And he's like hours and hours late. And then if he does show up, he doesn't have the thing when he says he had it. So, like, to me, if I have that much riding on something and the guy is, like, chronically late, and then when he finally does show up, it turns out he's been lying to you the whole time, that's going to sever the relationship for me. I mean, and- that's... Go ahead. Sorry. Well, and, and that's that's the other thing, like uh, the conflicts he would have, even with people who were his friends, like he was saying things and they were saying the things to him that me personally would be like, I'm never talking to that person again. But it seemed like no big deal. You know, like right. the next scene, they're talking again. Yeah. Like he beat the shit out of me and then, oh, we're still friends or I hate you. You're an asshole. And the next time you see him, oh, hey, buddy, what's up? I don't know if that's a New York thing. That's a big city thing, but it 
yeah, you're right. I, for me, that was like that crosses so many friendship lines that I don't even know what kind of relationship. Yeah, like is. so many times I'd be like, all right, well, I'm done with that person, you know. <laughs> and then next scene, oh, okay, everything's okay. It's like um, uh, the Adam Sandler character in this. It's a serious movie, but he's not taking like he's acting seriously in serious situations, but he's not treating them seriously. It's kind of this weird thing. He is a child. He's absolutely seems to be a child living in fantasy land where the consequences of his actions never going to materialize. He thinks he he seems like he's going to be able to endlessly float and play this adrenaline high forever. And it's, it's never going to come home to roost. And that's why I was rooting for him to die. I was rooting for him to have consequences. I'm the exact opposite of Pat in this movie. He was rooting for Adam to succeed and do well and hit this big win. And I'm rooting for him to face the consequences of his actions. I, against my, my best interest, I was rooting for him. I think like it was, it was, it was a bit more complicated than that. Like, yeah, I, I wanted him to win despite myself because I, I, he was such a greasy kind of grimy character, and um, yeah. So I was gonna go on this whole thing about how I was watching this film in preparation for us to talk about it, and I couldn't find any sort of like libertarian and cap angles to go at, and I think we identified some like in terms of like exploitation and the ethiopians like why did he get this ethiopian or or the gem market or something like that i guess but i i kept thinking of this thing like an undergrad of course i went to the university of minnesota and the whole department was a bunch of marxists and so all they would do seriously my whole degree was all about class conflict and that was the only fucking lens they could see anything through and so I was like, well, how does this relate to the ANCAP movement? Or at least like to your show? Because what you do is you view things through an ANCAP lens. But what do we do with this show when there's so much more here aside from just an ANCAP NAP analysis? You know what I mean? But because there's so much. Yeah, but, well, I think Robert's made a point uh, a, a couple of shows ago where we're less a libertarian ANCAP show per se. I mean, we still pepper it in here and there, but we're more of just a movie review show at this point. And I, yeah. I think there's some validity to that argument, though I think we do, or at least I try to shoehorn some stuff in. <laughs> yeah. But um, you did mention that the, the Ethiopians and the um, exploitation, and Kevin Garnett actually brings up this point in the film. Yep. He's like, wait, wait, wait. So how much did you pay these guys in Ethiopia for this? And you're trying to sell it for a million dollars? And Sandler's point is, hey, I'm paying them 50 lifetimes worth of what they would earn, you know, in, in an entire lifetime. So, you know, relatively speaking, they're doing very, very well. Uh, and, you know, KG's kind of arguing that, that he's doing it for almost racist reasons. But Garnett also misunderstands the structure of production because this is the raw good coming out of the earth is going to be one price versus bringing it all the way through the supply chain to a place where it's actually saleable right there's a there's a time frame that's involved there's connections there's you know these guys found it in the earth it's not like they found it ready for auction with the right connections to be able to auction it there's a whole series of events and things that need to happen for it to go from one place to another. And so for Garnett to misunderstand that and say, well, right out of the ground, it's worth the million dollars is not true. You know, for it to be in the position to be sold, for a consumer to be able to buy it, that infrastructure means to market, to bring that good into position, uh, into a state to be purchased, is another string of the value that gets imbued into the product and if, of course it's all subjective value it's whoever's willing to pay a certain amount for it and that appraisal the underpricing of the appraisal almost poisons the well for the auction right because his original appraisal was going to go into that catalog and say oh yeah it's 
valued between 800,000 and 1.2 million dollars. And so the bid would start at a certain amount and probably get over a million dollars. But when they came back and said, oh, you know, the appraisal is 100 to 150. Well, of course, he's going to be upset by that. Now, I don't know what the true value or the true appraisal of something like that would be. But Pat, I'll direct this question to you. Do you think that Sandler would have had a case in that the appraisal um, being so low compared to what he thinks a fair market appraisal would be like? And there wasn't time to go to a third party to really get like an objective appraisal, which of course solves the Ayn Rand problem of competing defense agencies uh, blank out. You know, you'd, you'd have a third one adjudicate that they would all agree to beforehand. But uh, what, what's your take on that? Like, do you think that, that they were doing him not quite a harm, but like impacting his um, potential for value or potential for sale? And, and this gets really muddy, you know, because like you're not owed what you could make or whatever. But do you think that there was an effect with their lowballing the uh, the appraisal? I, I think that's a really complicated question because at the at the same time you're what is your market in terms of what the the um, the auction is it, it didn't seem to me like this was a open market auction it was a closed market auction and at the same time that Adam Sandler um, that Ari he needs to sell the gem um, at any point in time, I think he could have withdrawn his gem from the auction. And so I don't think it's an NAP violation per se or, you know, any violation of property rights because he could have withdrawn it at any point in time. But the problem is, and this is the whole point of the movie, is that his time preference is so high, he needs to sell it. Yeah, and well, he's, he's, he's got so much money owed to so many people. Right. That he, he almost whether he wants to or not he has to do it all quickly yeah and and but from the auctioneer's point of view they don't give a fuck why should they you know you don't like it go somewhere else did that yeah, answer your question go ahead robert or, oh i was just gonna i was gonna make the question i mean i understand the um get the money quickly and he needed this auction to happen but if he was so upset that he had to have a certain amount why not set a minimum reserve price like this is the minimum amount I'll take for this this opal. I I won't take anything less than 175. Because that would break the plot. Well, yeah, there's well, that. Fair enough. And, yeah, one one final comment on uh, KG's point. Like, well, you're kind of ripping off these Ethiopian dudes. Uh, the Ethiopian dudes stole this opal from the mine that they don't own. So, do you think that they can fu fully expect to fence? a stolen item for the full retail value yeah yeah, they're, yeah I, would, they're I, would, to... I would hope not no they're lucky to get whatever he's offering and, and obviously he's offering the highest price that they can get yeah and they're totally agreeable to it you know and, it, and like you said it's 50 times their uh, lifetime wages plus um you know what he thought he was only offering them 10 percent of the the final retail price it ended up being over half yeah, and I really liked his argument against KG when he was saying, "Hey, do you do you want to win by one or do you want to win by 30? This is what I do. I'm adding value to this product by talking about it, by showing it to you, by showing it to other people, whatever his means is." And uh, yeah, he he wants to get the maximum value out of his product. Who doesn't? Who doesn't right, want to yeah. sell it for the most? Is is he evil for wanting to get the most out of his property that's just yeah well and moreover he's taking the risk you know what if it's nothing he's never seen it before he's seen it on a on a documentary television program right yeah, yeah. he had, a and he had to, to smuggle it in in a bunch of fish yeah yeah so he's he's not only doing that risk like the he's putting a certain amount of money in and he's not sure what he's going to get out of it or what the items actually going to be when it arrives or if it he's gets also caught doing by an, an illegal inspectors. shit yeah it could customs could have seized it right yeah so so there were like several times of risk i mean he's this is another example of his gambling and and like you were saying you know he has that competitive 
nature to him, similar to KG. That's how he's able to identify with him. It's almost a what, whatever means necessary approach, which ends up being his downfall. Because d- despite like actually winning a couple of things like that would have gone in his favor, but other people kind of took them away from him, like that one bet that he made with the uh, maitre d' at the restaurant, where uh, it was like the first playoff game against um, the Sixers, and Arno, his his brother-in-law, Arno takes blocked, the yeah. bet. Yeah, he blocks the bet, and he would have paid off big, like a couple hundred grand or whatever. He would have paid off Arno. Would have paid off like all this other stuff. He probably would have been broken even. But of course, he's a, he's an addict, so he he wouldn't have stopped. You know, he just continued on. Uh, but he had that, and then also the gem itself. Um, not work out for him due to things outside of his control, right? So Arno stopped that bet. That was out of his control. The appraiser kind of stopped the auction going up as high. Uh, so that was another, like, like a, a, a win that he should have had, right? Because had the original appraisal gone through, it probably would have auctioned for a lot more than it did. Um, and then he finally does strike big on this, like, 28-way parlay with uh, his girlfriend taking the money that KG gives him for the gem that he should have paid off Arno, should have paid off his father-in-law, should have paid off the guy that he gave the fake watch to. Like, he should have made as much of those folks whole as he could have. Well, actually, he's only 175, and he owed all of that to his father-in-law. And he owed 100 to Arno. So I guess he was kind of fucked either way. Well, he was still Um, getting the money from the auctioneers. Right, but that was all going to go... Oh, wait, no, he wasn't getting any money from them. Yeah, he was. Well, from his father-in-law, though. Right. The father pays the auctioneers, they take their cut, and then he gets a, a big chunk of that. And then he can pay that back to his father-in-law. So he probably owed his father-in-law like 30 grand or something. Right, and then he still owed Arno 100 grand. Right. And he still owed the other guy however much. Right. And all of that. But um, this whatever means necessary aspect or approach and the super high time preference that he had... These were all things of his own making and due to the addictive nature or the addiction that he had to gambling and taking big risks. But when he finally did have it pay off, it was all for naught because he had made so many enemies along the way, people angry enough to kill him. And so it kind of ends in a way, and and we can start winding down the show here, I think, but it ends in a way where he has that one fleeting moment of it all coming together he wins the big bet his girlfriend he dies says happy she loves him yeah and before he can even realize he's going to get shot in the head he dies with a smile on his face yeah so he had that one nirvanic probably moment. the best way he could have ever gone out otherwise he ends homeless and destitute and dying yeah. of some curable disease in a in an alley i mean it doesn't end happy the other timeline this way he he goes out on top so this is the this is the the ending point too where it all comes home i think is because what does what does an uncut gem mean what do you guys make of and i know it's cliche because it's the title of the film but what do you guys make of the fact that kg sees this gem and he looks in it and he sees his whole path to becoming an nba star and when i think when ari looks into the gem he sees whatever he makes of it i i can't remember if that's the case but is in this kind of plays into too because i was looking at other analysis of of the film and that ari's character basically is an uncut gem in of itself because he has admirable qualities but they are unrefined and I think that's the overall theme of the film. What do you guys make of that? Well, and then looking into the gem and seeing like the intricacies of all these things that are billions of years old, like doesn't he make mention of like this gem was created when the universe was created. And that's what, like how it came to be and it like landed on earth and then it got compacted into this aggregate or whatever. I mean, I don't know, you can probably read a bunch of analogies into this, and, and that's one of the things, like we were talking about earlier, there's um, a certain artistic quality to this film, to where it is without narrative, and it is somewhat ambiguous, and so you can read into it so many different things and, and different perspectives. 
So I don't know if I, I mean, Garnett seemed to look at this as a way to rejuvenate himself or psych himself up. Like he, he felt that this had mystical powers to him because he was near the, the ending of his career. So he was looking for whatever would amp him up enough to, to be able to play a couple of good more games. I mean, I don't know how much longer he played after this. I don't think it was that long. Um, and granted, he, he you know, he, they shot this film probably just a couple of years ago, so he still looks like he's, you know, playing weight, looked like. Man's in good shape still. Yeah, man. Looks good. You still beat me. Um, I, I I don't know about the, the mystical whatevers, but I do know that I, I didn't see Adam Sandler as an uncut gem. I... I, I refuse to say that he's got all these wonderful qualities. This this movie was a train wreck. Like his life was a train wreck. The movie's great, but this was a horrifying watching a descent into destruction, self destruction. This is an addict hitting rock bottom. This is the same as like a train spotting movie or you know any kind of addict where he is destroying all his relationships. He's ruining his own life all to satisfy his addiction. And it's fascinating and it's compelling, but I didn't, I wasn't rooting for this guy. I didn't think he was a good guy. I think he was somebody who had succumbed to his addiction. He had given up on living any kind of a rational life. He was chasing the dragon 24-7. And the people in his life that cared about him, be damned. He was willing to sacrifice everything. Not necessarily like he was going to sell his kids to whatever, like a pedophile or something. But he, he didn't give a damn that he was pissing off people with shark eyes. I mean, it, it seemed like a very... I hate to say the word selfish, but I mean, cause you know, you own your own body, you own your own life and you live it however you want. But it seemed to be like, he kind of, he was a father and his children relied on him for sustenance, for love, for stewardship, for fathership, you know, all the reasons you would need a dad. And he was on a train to death or an early grave and to be chasing that dragon is the same as like just just doing heroin and then he's like a useless dad deadbeat on the street um i i think he's an example of what not to do not what how not to be a parent how not to be a father how not to be a human being this is a tragic story of a man succumbing to his addiction fascinating compelling but this movie was like watching a train wreck I mean, did you see any qualities to him, though? I mean, even though they were not likable, but did you see any qualities to him that could be considered admirable in terms of talent or the ability to hustle or or anything like that or the person ability to interact with KG or high profile clients? Because when I think of the term uncut gem, I don't think of maybe a moral superiority or morality or anything but he had these qualities you know i guess that's what i'm getting at is when i say that i root for him it's like you know i'd like things to turn out for him and for his family to be okay and all that kind of stuff um but also that he has these innate abilities even though i think he's a despicable person it's it's more complicated than saying he's a good guy or he's a bad guy and that's what i think makes good film or art yeah, no, there's definitely some nuance there. Let me ask you this though, question, though, Pat. When he was talking to his wife, he's at that Jewish event with his family and whatever, and he, he's talking to his wife, and he's like, give me another chance. Give me another shot. Before she talks, before she answers, what did you want her to say? No. So you were rooting against him, too. I definitely I, wanted her to laugh in his face and say, are you kidding? Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. 
Because, but I mean, I guess that's because I know that he was gonna milk her for everything. Um, I mean, even though I wanted everything to come together to him, I guess I didn't view it in the same way that you did in terms of, well, okay, what happens if he wins, right? Are his kids going to be okay? Is his marriage going to be okay? Is his wife going to be taken care of? Yeah, definitely Fuck not. No. He's going <laughs> to bet it all <laughs> again. Yeah, he's going to roll it. He's going to yeah, keep it right. going, man. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm. So what is the uncut gem part of him? I mean, you know, like, okay, what's the, what is the true well, meaning of the work of art? What is the true right. meaning of the work of art? Is it what the, the artist intends it to be? Or is it what we perceive it to be? It can only be what you perceive it to be. I think everybody's going to have their own opinion on it, including the artist himself or herself. Yeah. But what yeah. was? What do you think? And maybe Daniel, what do you think the artist's intent is here in, with this uncut gem thing? What's the admirable qualities? Well, I think what they're trying to say is that <clears throat> Sandler's character has a good heart, but he's let his addictions kind of take over. <clears throat> and so, while he means well. He can't help himself. And so he doesn't want to go out of his way to hurt people, but he is only thinking of himself for that big score, that big win. Everything else be damned. Um, and it is kind of amazing when this cascading series of events happen. He's handling them rather deftly for the precariousness, precariousness in which they are. I mean, He's managing like all these ideas and these deadlines and all these things in his head. Like there's one scene where he's answering the phone call. And he's trying to call the lawyer to threaten KG's like counsel or whatever. And then like someone else is calling to chew him out. And he's like doing all this stuff and it's just rapidly, rapid fire. And he's like shifting gears so quickly. Like he has these innate skills and abilities that if he would just apply them to something of value, he could have been tremendous. But he was so consumed by this addiction to gambling and to just putting it all on the line and all risking everything, despite having a good heart. And perhaps that's the uncut gem portion. Like he has some good qualities where he means well, but it's so not refined that he's actually causing all this harm. Yeah, this he this Carrie's character reminds me of George in Of Mice and Men. He's just this simple guy. He just wants to pet the bunnies, he, but he doesn't know the harm he's causing. And Lenny has to put him down. And this is the movie is, is, is him getting put down. Uh, Adam Sandler's character getting put down. He doesn't know <laughs> the harm he's causing. He's a he's a good hearted man who's just who's smart, but he's he, he doesn't understand what damage he's doing to the people around him. And he yeah. pays for it. I, I think that in like a Jordan P Peterson way, it's like this gem represents the chaos of potential in a certain way. It's very interesting. Yeah, and had he had he honed it down and refined it, perhaps he would have been, um, you know, a more complete person, a more effective person, providing more value and being more successful. Though I mean, he seemed to be in a position where he had excess in with which to risk throwing away. I, w I wonder how that relates to KG. You know, what does K does KG when he looks into the gem and he sees everything that brought him to the point of being an NBA star? Is he seeing the true potential of the gem? You know, is is has he refined the the chaos of potential in his own and he's rediscovering it now? I don't know, I guess. Well, I, I think know. he he saw the end of his career and he was like looking for something to spark him for you know one final run at the championship or to re-see the chaos of the potential in his earlier career maybe i don't know well yeah, it does it was, i don't know about this reseeding in chaos and potential and stuff and i can't speak to that but I, it is interesting it does it does kind of raise an interesting uh issue of sports psychology and how a lot of high-end super high high-end athletes get into this kind of power of positive thinking and just a belief in something and it's, it goes beyond because there's so much i mean you're at the highest level you need an edge and you're looking for that edge and it's so much of performance is psychological you can you could be all prepared like physically 
but you if you don't prepare emotionally and mentally for the actual event happening now at this point in his career garnett's a veteran and he's been on this stage many many times and he's looking for that edge but in terms of general sports performance the psychological aspect is very vastly under analyzed i would say and the the level of sports psychology necessary for high-end performing athletes um is am i just going to repeat myself again well there's a lot of mind over matter that happens like if if you think you can't do something then you can't and if right. you think that you can like uh i've run a couple of marathons and not enough to like really know what i'm talking about too much here but like if your mind if you give up in your mind then your body will break down but if you fight yeah. through it and you're mentally like i'm gonna do this somehow you find a way and i think that that's sort of what garnett was looking for he's looking for something to spark his mental to bring his body along because his body was older and been through injuries and all of these things yeah for sure no like in in, in fighting like i like ufc a lot and you know you go through like a five round war and it's the guy that mentally quits is the guy that's going to lose a lot of the time because it's it's everybody's bodies are just broken down and it's it's the guy that whose eye is dull and just like no i'm i'm done if that's well it. shit i i just yeah. learned two new things about you guys even though i've known you for like four years now so i didn't know that daniel i didn't know you ran marathons and robert <laughs> i didn't know you were into ufc because i'm into running and i'm into ufc what, so what do we just become best friends <laughs> uh. yep <laughs> um well oh shit i mean how much jordan peterson have you watched robert i mean this is all he talks about is the chaos of potential Oh shit! Well, I guess not enough. I, I have seen a few things, a few talks that he's done, but no, I guess I guess I, I don't. This is new to me. I've, well, I've been, you know, I'm struggling with life transitions right now. If y'all want to know everything about my myself, even a colonoscopy. So here we go. Um, but you know, this is so akin to what it's like being a lawyer too. I mean, you, a lot of it's a mental game. You know, you're you're enough. There's a lot of grind to it at the same time, but. Um, I'm, I'm reading books right now about how to perform as a lawyer and it's all about this, these mental games that you play with yourself and, and how you view yourself and a lot, Jordan Peterson has had a lot to do with my own journey too, trying to figure out, you know, what the hell I'm doing and, uh, there's the chaos of potential. I don't know. There's not much else to say about it, I guess. Well, we, we should probably say much more about this stuff in the bonus content that we have available for our Patreon supporters at lastnighters.com slash Patreon because we're already past the normal length of the show, unfortunately. So I have a few more notes related to the film. I think I'll maybe mention them in the bonus content. But before we uh, get into that, we got to end with final summary and review. So we'll go to Robert. Unless, you, unless you, anyone has any final notes they want to sneak in there, just slip it in there. Yeah, one quick thing. What is this performance in terms of, I, we touched on this, but in terms of uh, Adam Sandler's career, performance of his career, what do you think? Quickly. Best ever. Best ever. I thought he was great in Punch Drunk Love. I thought he's a great like leading romantic lead in um, Fifty First Dates and that sort of thing, and Wedding Singer, that kind of thing. He's very charming, very funny, very affable. I could see how people would like him how women would you know like him despite he's not the best looking guy ever but in this film i mean that's why i didn't buy the romance because he's just placed this train wreck of a guy in this movie but fantastic performance i mean it, the best of his career for sure that i've okay. seen okay i'm gonna say i prefer him and billy madison and happy gilmore because that's the height of his powers his comedic powers but this is the height of his acting this is his best acting performance not as most entertaining, not as most fun, not a movie I'm going to go back and watch again and again like I have seen Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison a dozen times each. I want him to see, I want him to do more stuff like this. I think his, his, his recent comedy movies are garbage. They're not funny at all. But this stuff I can fully get on board with and I would watch another film of this quality level from him for sure. Oh, right, yeah, he has done a couple of movies. Like there was one where he's like a, CIA agent or something, and then another one who's like in a Western comedy kind of thing, maybe on Netflix. 
It's all vague because I didn't watch them. But I'm sure they were terrible. Yeah. They're all super panned, unfunny, toilet humor. I don't know. It's it's more like it's more like he has a bunch of money. He gets a bunch of money from Netflix and he makes a bunch of movies, crappy movies with his friends, and they all have a great time making them and they don't care about the quality. And that's fine for him, great for him. Not so great if you're, you know, a fan that you want to see him do good stuff. But he doesn't know you don't you know he doesn't owe me anything he can do what he wants he's a he's a grown-ass man and uh, when he does stuff like this i will applaud him and then when he does some um, scatological uh, cowboy western i'll be like eh, it's not for me that's maybe for some 12 year old somewhere all right well that's a good jumping off point into final summary and review so robert if you want to take it from there well uh, initially, I was just right off the bat really impressed with the intro and how it's, I mean, it seemed like the director had really been watching a lot of Stranger Things. It it very much struck me as this kind of 80s, kind of really set the set some kind of a weird mood. I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Like, what what is this? What am I going to be watching? Is this some sort of psychedelic uh, 60s or 70s? But then it kind of had this 80s, like neon techno vibe. And then it was this thriller dramedy serious thing about this jeweler so what well, i don't know what it is but i know i like it it's um it's got excellent performances it uh it's a living breathing world as much as i don't think it's a very realistic character it's definitely a very exciting and compelling character like i like i said i think he it's it's unrealistic for him to have lived this long. <laughs> he would have died years and years ago if this is, is his character. Now, maybe this, like Pat's saying, this is his rock bottom and he's on this like sharp decline and he's just now reaching the peak of his de depravity. I guess that's what we're, we're led to believe. But um, yeah, uh, excellent film. I would give this like an 8.5. I, I, I kind of tend to agree with Daniel that I wouldn't necessarily come back to it a whole lot. Um, maybe I'll watch it again in a few years or maybe five or 10 years and kind of like enjoy it again. But it is a very much a high tension film and you got to be in the right kind of frame of mind to enjoy that. I was kind of watching it and enjoying it, but then it got to be too much for me and I would shut it off and then start it up again. So maybe it's bettest you know enjoyed in chunks of time I, I i really don't know whatever you want to do but i i did i do recommend this film this is this is a lot of fun i'm glad pat recommended it i enjoyed this conversation i'm just going to say it's an 8.5 from me highly recommended uh experience at least once um, even if you don't like adam sandler's other work this is a serious piece that puts him along you know like the highly competent Hollywood actors. He's at the top of his acting powers and uh, he plays a compelling character. Even if it is, it's not a likable character, it's still something that I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to see how it all ended up. So good stuff. All right, very good. Yeah, I think that uh, Jim Carrey had a similar arc where he had like really ridiculous stuff early in his career where he was just a slapstick, rubber-faced comedic guy. And then he came back and did Eternal Sunshine and a couple of other like darker, more acty, acting chops worthy films. Um, but I don't know where he's at now. I know he's in Sonic the Hedgehog, which I haven't seen. And he, is he Sonic in that one? He's Dr. Robotnik. Dr. Robot. I he's the villain. I don't even know what that he's is. A, he's a rubbery, oh, okay. evil villain guy. All right, so he's bringing it back. It's, well, it's, I think it's, it's... I've only seen the trailers, but it seems like the perfect role for him. Or at least it okay. maybe the perfect role for him 20 years ago. Well, when I saw him in Kick-Ass 2, I hated him. I don't remember what he was in Kick-Ass 2. He was like Colonel Karate Chop or something. Like He's only in it for maybe half the movie. Because he dies in it, but he's like this okay, strong, I would have to chinned, it, like you didn't like cut it? military guy, over the top. Well, he loves to play over the top. 
But anyway, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. Whoever, whoever's turn it is, go. All right. Well, I'll, I'll since you mentioned my name, I'll say that this is a movie that <clears throat> I enjoy, but it is uh, there's a lot of frantic kinetic stuff going on. It's just tension after tension, and so you might need a break. Uh, and it also might not be something that you want to watch again, but I think it is a worthy experience. It is probably one of Sandler's strongest acting performances. Um, in a way, I did kind of root for him because it does seem like he has a good heart, but he's just making mistake after mistake after mistake. And after a while, you're just amazed that he's still alive and that, that things haven't happened to him earlier uh, prior to this. Um, but overall, it's it's a good experience. It's well done. Uh, the dialogue is great. The uh, gorilla style camera work is good. That really kind of adds to the tension and the the chaotic nature of it. Uh, I, I don't think I liked it as much as as Robert or Pat did, but I'll go with a seven point five on this. I think it's it's well worth watching and and it's worth the price of um, you know a Netflix subscription to uh, to have it included. So uh, let's go over to you, Pat, for your score and. Uh, We'll go from there. Yeah, so I guess it's no mis um I guess no surprise that I really enjoyed this film. I probably I think it's a masterpiece. And I I, I don't think I really I don't know, maybe I'm just a fanboy and I like to hand those out ad nauseum, but this really was and it, I really want to profess my love for A twenty four and that production company. They've had a lot of incredible films mostly horror films that I've really enjoyed because that's really my thing. But um, they've also had a, a lot of really deep films that really make you think. And I'm such an eclectic fan of film that those movies that really make you think that aren't necessarily the easiest to watch are the ones that I like the most. And I think the conversations that we've had in this episode are a testament to basically how deep this film is and how many different ways that you could analyze it. Uh, in terms of sheer how uncomfortable this film made me physically, um, really uncomfortable. And I think, again, that's uh, a tribute to exactly an example of exactly how this film achieves what I think it sets out to do is make a deep, claustrophobic, gritty film um, that is, it's just really great on a lot of different levels. So, I, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I really hope that you um, find a lot of the same things in the film that I did. But at least, you know, even if even if it isn't maybe a 10 out of 10 in terms of enjoyability, um, I don't know that works of art always should be enjoyable. Um, but I think it is. I think I'd give it maybe a 9.5 or a 9. What do you guys think? <laughs> Well, that's that's high praise, high praise, and I think that you've said uh, a lot of the episodes that you've been on with us talking about movies that they were masterpieces as well. So maybe you're an easy grader. I don't Have know. I really? <laughs> I I probably didn't say that about Liar Liar. I think I said that about The Shining. What American else? Psycho. American Psycho. No, but I I. Um, My cousin Vinny. <laughs> not a masterpiece. Star Trek: The Next Generation. Masterpiece. Rogue One. Rogue One, not a masterpiece. Wild Wild Country? Not a masterpiece. Right, so we're just going through the list time. of prior I said, appearances. I said The Shining. The Shining was a masterpiece. That's it. I don't think I don't think you can knock me on that one. No, Robert hated that one, though. It's true. I still hate it. But I gotta appreciate your enjoyment of the film. I Dr. Respect Sleep. Your, I respect, oh, Dr. Sleep was fun. Dr. Sleep was great. The fuck? That, you yeah, make man. No you make no huh. sense. Doctor Sleep was totally a different movie. Okay, who the who the fuck are you showing next week for your your little show that you got here? What are you doing? Oh boy! All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. This is a good segue. So next week, we're gonna bring back our guest from Les Miserables. Just because Robert loves musicals, musicals so hard, we did Les Miserables with a buddy of ours named Alex Hay. And uh, he suggested over a year ago that I should check out this movie, Alita Battle Angel. Hmm. And I finally watched it this past weekend and it was good. There's there's a lot of stuff worth talking about in it. And I was like, all right, I finally watched this movie and uh, you willing to come on? And he said, yes. So 
that is 90% sure that he's going to come on for Alita Battle Angel next week. Have you seen this, Robert? Yeah, I saw it, uh, geez, I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago. But is it a masterpiece? No. Well, tune in next week and you'll find out. <laughs> Spoilers, no. It's not bad. It's not bad, but I, I would definitely not put it in the masterpiece category. Yeah, well, it is on the old HBO Max, so we both have access to it. And uh, so we'll be doing that next week, uh, audience. Uh, so you guys can support us by going to lastnighters.com slash Patreon. You can see how the sausage is made. There's some other bonus content that uh, we're going to be offering, like perhaps watching a movie with us. I think I can have up to eight different guests watching it simultaneously. I'm not sure exactly how we interact with each other, but perhaps that's something we can all... Uh, learn together um, and uh, Robert are there some other things that people can do to support what we do here oh yeah there's always ways to do that Daniel you can um, write at me write a letter and you can send it to us you can be like Robert you're awesome you're just the best you make me happy and then that'll make me feel good and then I'll be like man this is why I do this show just you know making people feel happy and then also, you could do the Patreon. You could go to Trupshire.com and buy some merchandise. You could uh, subscribe to us on the YouTubes. You could subscribe on whatever platform you're currently listening, which you probably already do. Uh, you can join our Facebook groups. You know, you can just interact with us. You can talk to us and tell us why we're wrong. Tell us why we're right. Tell us why we make you so, so happy all the time. Probably yeah, ones. or suggest suggest movies to us, or visit the sites of our guests, like yeah, Pat yeah, yeah. Farley, Patty's got some stuff doing. LibertyWeekly.net. Uh, and the last right two summers, we did a summer series with you each year, and I kind of feel like maybe you know we're halfway through summer now, and we're, we're, we're maybe missing that. So I don't know if there's something yeah. we can work out, or or maybe a late summer, like it, we'll call it. Can can you say this these days? Indian summer. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm definitely open to that. I, I need more excuses to kickstart episodes of my show because, oddly enough, the, the last episode I did is the most downloaded episode that I have in my whole catalog. So um, it's very interesting. But, well, I, I really appreciate you guys having me on the show. I had a lot of fun tonight. And um, y'all can catch me at libertyweekly.net, and hopefully I'll be back. I also had a spinoff show less formal called Liberty Bigly that you can find like uh, Donald Trump, Liberty Bigly shout out to, uh, Oh God, I know who gave me that uh, Kyle Anselone's co-host that shows up. You know who I'm talking about? I feel uh, really Will? bad. Will, Will Porter. Will Porter. I love Will Porter. And uh, he came up with that name. So anyways, uh, really great to join you guys. Love Will Porter. He has excellent work. That's it. Uncut Gems, masterpiece. All right. Pat McFarlane of Liberty Weekly, masterpiece. Well, thank you for joining us, Pat. And I hope you can stick around for some Kathleen Turner Overdrive, the bonus content available for the Patreon supporters. Uh, people can find the show notes and more at lastnighters.com slash 135. Check out Pat's work at libertyweekly.net. And uh, we will say good night from last night, everyone. Peace out. All right, we're going to continue the transmission for just a couple minutes here on the Actual Anarchy Podcast. This is episode 192 of the show. You can find the show notes more at actualanarchy.com slash 192. Uh, we went a little bit long on the uh, last night's portion of the show, so uh, we will be getting the Kathleen Turner Overdrive in just a few moments. But I did want to just mention that um, there is the, and I'll direct this to you, Robert, in the the history of diamond mining especially in africa south africa it's it's a lot oftentimes related to the british empire like uh the the roads um cecil Rhodes, i think was his name he was a british diplomat who ran the diamond cartel in south africa so it was a, a symbol of british empire and then they had the cartel arrangement with de beers restricting supply driving up the price um but in this movie 
they show us that the mine is owned by Chinese interests. And so it's almost like a different type of imperialism, not so much military, but more economic or financial. And I think I've seen things like this related to um, China's investment in natural resources and uh, extraction in places like Africa. And I'm wondering if that is um, viewed as imperialistic in nature or if it's an improvement in the capital structure and thus providing value and improving the living conditions and the standard of living for people in those areas in which those investments are made. What's your take on that? I guess it would depend on how those investments are made. Like are, are, are these crony handouts where, where some company will come in and pay off some politicians to get the sweet land deal that they're not giving anybody else? You know what I mean? Or is this like a, an actual market where they come in, you know, justifiably, justly purchase rights to the mine or purchase the land that the mine, the mine is on and invests in that way and in thus, you know, creates capital value? Um, I don't really know the details. I would guess that a lot of the complaints would be that they're doing it in the crony way. But that's a lot, oftentimes the only way to operate. Maybe the, the government's sitting on these lands and they're not, they're holding them back from development. And then the only way you can get access to them to develop it is to go through some crony backdoor deal with the government payoff or something like that. Because there is no legal way to do it, no market way to do it. I mean, I, I think I generally tend to think that most people if given the option, would prefer a market solution. That it's going to be a cheaper way to do it. I mean, not necessarily. I mean, you can just graft one guy and then he hands it to you. But I don't know. I don't know. I guess it depends on how that works out because we're not given those details in this situation. Daniel. Yeah, I'd agree. I think that's uh, one of the things that we just don't have the knowledge to really be able to speak to it. But I, I can see how the um, the leftist critique of capitalism being imperial in nature makes some sense. Like, you're going to militarily go, like even Smedley Butler said in his book War is a Racket, that I wasn't there on the behest of the people of the United States. I was on, I was there on the behest of General Electric and Coca-Cola and whatever, like opening up markets and uh, things like that. So using military to open up markets in an imperialist sense. And we sort of see like in this movie where they show the Chinese are owning it, that perhaps it's a new style of doing it, not so much militarily, but financially. But again, we don't know enough details to really. Well, it, it's, it all gets solved with property rights. You know, if the government isn't in there inter interfering in the market and somebody actually legitimately owns that land, then they can decide to do business with these Chinese investors or not. And then, and generally speaking, I think they're going to prefer that investment money because everybody's going to make money off the deal. It's going to be preferable to the previous situation where the wealth is just sitting there, not providing anything of value. So yeah, I mean, unless they really value that land for its scenic qualities and its tourism and that kind of thing, and you want to leave it you know, as is, but usually there's other land that can satisfy that need where you've got this one location where you can find red opals or black opals or whatever opals are coming out of that place or diamonds or whatever uh, you're going to want to take advantage of that situation because you're going to make a lot of money and it's going to improve your life and the life of all the people that you're going to give jobs to yeah i think that uh, the nature of um, wasting a resource is to not use it at all you know so they're making use yeah. of it and putting the capital 
in there. So at least it's going to benefit somebody who's in that position. Now we don't know where the money came from necessarily. And that will play a role in like the, um, I guess the morality of the series of events that is downstream from that. But anyway, uh, we should probably end the show there and go into the Kathleen Turner Overdrive. So I'm going to thank our audience one more time and thank Pat for being a guest, even though you didn't contribute any additional other than you being on screen and eating uh, for this portion of the show, but that's totally fine. Uh, people can check out your stuff at libertyweekly.net. Hopefully that you will have uh, some new episodes, new content coming out, or perhaps a special of some series with us. Uh, we'd love to have you on for that. Uh, and uh, everyone can check out uh, last night's, or sorry, actualanarchy.com slash 192 with show notes and more will be readily available. And we will check out uh, the movie next week, Alita Battle Angel. So join us next week. And we'll see you guys then. Peace out, everyone. Maximum freedom. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do